Hey Guru Nation, welcome back to another YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram video. Uh, I eventually want to go in depth breaking down a clinical trial protocol, but for this particular video, I'm going to make it like 10 minutes because I know attention spans are short. Um, I unfortunately can't show you any protocol I'm working on or any previous protocol I've worked on because we sign all kinds of CDAs, NDAs, not to do that kind of stuff. But I'm, I have it in front of me and I'm gonna go through the sections of the protocol uh, and I'm gonna kind of explain what they mean and what you should focus on if you're either a coordinator or a CRA um, because some sections of a protocol, depending on your job are more important than others. So I'm gonna go through this protocol, it's about 81 pages the one I'm looking at. The first thing, the very first thing is the protocol synopsis. And what the protocol synopsis is, is like a cliff notes for the protocol. So in this particular protocol, and all of them are like this, they have the title of the study, what phase, how many centers are participating, so how many sites, how many subjects, how many subjects are planned to get the IP, versus the placebo or the current standard of treatment, which is the comparator um, IP. The objectives, so the primary objective is usually efficacy or some kind of endpoint that measure, uh, whatever the gold standard is of endpoints that measures that particular therapeutic indication. For example, in schizophrenia, it's positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia is usually one of the primary endpoints. Secondary is usually uh, safety and tolerability, um, but it could be anything. I mean, a phase threes could be different. You know, the primary endpoint could be efficacy and safety. The secondary objectives could be other endpoints and safety. So the objectives uh, are unique to the studies, but uh, they're usually uh, are along the variety of what I've mentioned. Then you have the study design. So it tells you exactly how the study is designed. So this tells you the screening period. Then it tells you which subjects are gonna be randomized. What's the uh, randomization ratio? So two to one, three to one, meaning for every two that go into the investigational product, one will go on placebo or comparator drug, et cetera. Uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. If you are a coordinator, if you are a CRA, this is probably the most important section for you is the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Your job as a CRC, all right, is to make sure the patients are being safe. Now, really it's your PI's job, but let's face it, you, the coordinator are doing the majority of the work. So you have a huge role to play in making sure that the inclusion and exclusion criteria is met for every single subject. One of the worst things you can do, maybe the worst thing you can do in a study is randomize someone who shouldn't have been randomized. That could be a safety issue. That's obviously a potential, a data integrity issue. There's all kinds of things. This is a GCP violation, protocol violation, major deviation, right? probably requires CAPA plan, corrective action, preventative action, might even get you kicked off the study uh, if you're working at the site. Same thing if you're a CRA, if you, you're the last line of defense between the site and the FDA, you are also the last line of defense when it comes to patient safety. So you need to make sure that the sites are following inclusion exclusion criteria. Don't just assume that they are because the physician PI is a physician and you're not, so they know more than you. Don't think that way. The reason you're being paid to do what you're doing is to keep patients safe as well. You're indirectly keeping patients safe, even though CRAs don't have any interaction with patients. By looking at the source and looking at the inclusion exclusion criteria, you are making sure that the patients who are randomized belong in the study. And if you find out that they're not, thus you need to let the sponsor know and you could potentially, like if it's a safety issue, you could have potentially avoided a major safety issue with the patient if you caught that early and the sponsor said to withdraw the patient because of a safety issue. So 
don't miss those things. Okay. Don't skip over the inclusion exclusion criteria. If you're working on a study as a coordinator or a PI, of course, or a CRA, you need, need, need to focus on the inclusion exclusion criteria. It's super important. The things that you can skip over are the analytical methods, um, all the statistics, right? Those are really not, you're not going to be that um, involved with the statistics when it comes to these studies. But uh, it's good to know, like, if you're going to do a site initiation visit, sometimes the investigators ask you questions. You can just refer to your slides. Hopefully, your sponsor or CRO made slides for you that you can present or just refer to the protocol. My favorite thing to do, if I were, I just told a client today, if I were dropped off at a site in the next hour and never looked at the protocol and was told to monitor that site, the first thing I would do is get the schedule of events from the protocol, right? The schedule of events is going to tell me most of what I need to know. It's not going to tell me inclusion exclusion criteria, so I'm going to need to look at that too, but it's going to tell me how the study is supposed to work when a patient is screened, when a patient's randomized, and when the patient has their visits, right? So it literally breaks down everything, the screening visit, all the assessments that need to be done. Then it gives you the visit windows in between visits. So like, for example, patients should be randomized within 30 days of screening. And then patients need to come in every week, plus or minus three days or so. I'm just giving you hypotheticals, could be anything. And then for each of those visits, it lists all the assessments and then it lists what needs to be done at those assessments. Now, they have footnotes. A lot of these assessments have footnotes. For example, I'm gonna go to one here. Uh, distribution and return of drug and diary. That's an assessment, right? And the footnote is only for the group receiving the um, investigational product. So this happens to be an open label study. This is not a double blind. So only for the group receiving the investigational product um, maybe that's not a good example. Uh, 12 lead EKG is another assessment with a footnote. So the footnote for that says, at screening and when deemed clinically necessary by the investigator. Okay, so that's just an example of footnotes. Footnotes can help you out a lot. Sometimes footnotes are really important. Sometimes footnotes really have all the details in there. So don't skip over the footnotes. So we went through the protocol synopsis. We went through the schedule of events. Those are probably the most important things you need uh, if you're coordinating or monitoring. But there's, um, when you get into the actual protocol, because that was just the synopsis on the schedule of assessments. When you get into the actual protocol, you got the background information. Sometimes they discuss previous studies. Sometimes they discuss the phase one. So if it's a phase two, they discuss the results from the phase one. They do the rationale. They talk about the rationale. Why is the study being done? They do the risk benefit assessment. So what is the risk and the benefits for the particular patients? Physicians are very interested in this kind of stuff. So are IRBs interested in this kind of stuff. You as a CRA or CRC may be less interested in this kind of stuff, but you should still know it because sometimes people are gonna ask you. All right, so sometimes patients might ask you if you're a coordinator, hey, well, what's the risk benefit? And technically the PI is supposed to answer that, but you know, in real world, coordinators answering a lot of these questions. Or if you're a CRA, the PI might ask you, hey, what's the uh, rationale for this? Why are we doing this? Well, turn to the protocol and pay attention. Then you, the next section is the study objectives. Okay, so what is it that we are studying? What's the primary endpoint? What's the secondary endpoint? What's the summary of the study design? Why are we selecting the population for patients that we are? What's the inclusion exclusion criteria? What's the premature discontinuation of patients? What's the definition of the end of the study? All right, then the next section gets into the investigational product, okay? Dosage, formulation, appearance, supply, packaging, labeling, storage, handling, uh, they do this for all the drugs being used in the study. So if there's several arms, they will do this for the investigational product. They'll do it for the comparator drug. They obviously won't do it for the placebo, but they might talk about what the supply and packaging and labeling looks like. Okay. 
Uh, then the administration of the IP. Okay, how does it? How is it done? What's the compliance? What's the compliance percentage? So if it's a investigational product that's taken orally, and the patients are given certain pills to take home and self-administer, there's usually a percentage compliance that the patients need to maintain. And the coordinators need to ensure that the patients are being compliant at every visit. And the CRAs, this is where the CRAs do IP investigational product accountability because the CRAs need to make sure the patients are being compliant as well as per the protocol. So if you're wondering what's the compliance requirements, it's in the protocol, okay? Then they talk about the treatment strategy. So this usually includes the opportunity for rescue medications, when to withdraw, when to do early termination, uh, treatment delay, when to hold out on a treatment, the criteria for different AEs and SAEs sometimes, okay? Then another section talks about warnings and precautions. So really the biggest section is the investigational product for most protocols, okay? Warnings and precautions, prior therapy and supportive care, con meds and prohibited meds. This is a, another very important thing you as a CRC and you as a CRA should not gloss over prohibited medications. Sometimes they are put in the protocol because they are dangerous to be mixed with the investigational product. Other times they're left off, they're prohibited because they can mess up the study results. So you really got to pay attention either way. One is a safety issue and one is the issue for data integrity and the, the validity of the data. But you're a CRC, you're a CRA, you are paid to know this stuff. You need to refer to your protocol. Sometimes these lists of prohibited meds are very long. They usually use the generic name for the drugs. So you may need to Google to make sure what's the brand name, what's the generic name. So when your patient tells you they're on a certain drug and it doesn't look on, it doesn't appear on your list, you need to see, is this the generic version of this? Because that's the same thing. They won't allow that drug. Okay, then it talks about the procedure for randomizing, blinding, if there's a blinding uh, for the study. Like I said, this one's open label. And then the IP accountability. The next section, it talks about the procedures and assessments. So it literally breaks down every single visit that occurs in the protocol. And it defines in detail, not just how it does on the schedule of assessments where it has a grid with all the visits horizontally, all the assessments vertically, and then check marks next to what, what assessments are done at what visit, and then footnotes for notes. This is more in depth. This is talking in detail about, this is what you do at screening. This is exactly how it should happen. This is what you do at randomization. This is when you should randomize, how many days after screening. It gives you all these details in there, okay? You gotta know those things too. Next section talks about efficacy, safety, adverse events. How do you report adverse events? How do you report serious adverse events? What are some adverse events of special interest to the sponsor? Definitely need to report based on how the sponsor wants. Um, PK, they talk about PK, pharmacokinetics. Uh, quality control, there's a section in there on monitoring, on data management, on quality assurance. You, if you're a CRA, obviously you need to pay attention to that. Uh, this is not to be confused with the monitoring plan. This is just some, some protocols have monitoring section in there for what you should be doing. In this case, it's a very short, for this protocol I'm looking at, it's a very short um, uh, paragraph on how monitoring is going to be done. Uh, next section, which a lot of coordinators and CRAs can skip really for the most part is statistics. So how they came up, how the sponsor came up with the sample size, the primary endpoint, the secondary endpoints, I wouldn't skip those two, those are important. Um, and then they talk about the description of the, st of the statistical analysis. So most, most uh, CRAs and CRCs skip that, but it, it's always good to know this stuff too, because like I said, patients might ask you, other clinicians might ask you, the more knowledgeable you are obviously about the protocol, the more confident you're gonna be to talk about it or answer questions about it. The next section is about IRBs, ethical considerations, um, how informed consent is going to be done, ethical conduct of the study, who's the IRB, subject data protection. Another section is 
how to handle the source documents this is called study administration. Uh, what's the investigator obligations. Um, then they have sections for protocol signatures, publication rights. If you're doing commercial industry sponsored research, you have no publication rights for the most part. Financing and insurance, which is for the site, you got to keep uh, insurance and then also the sponsor usually um, um, what's the word for it? the sponsor usually uh, geez, the word is coming is 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 not coming to me, but the sponsor oh in indemnifies okay the sponsor indemnifies um, the site as long as the protocol is being followed references. So they have previous studies, whatever they reference during the protocol. Appendices, all right, this is where they have the different rating scales, the diaries, the list of medications to use with caution. So not the prohibited. These are allowed, but with caution. And then uh, they, they abbreviate uh, terms. So if, you're, if this is your first study, you can go to the abbreviations section where they, they tell you AE means adverse event. Um, uh, another one is CRF means case report form. Another one, GMP means good manufacturing practices, et cetera. So if you are new to research, that might be helpful for you. Also, if you are new to the particular medical condition that you are studying right now on this protocol, they do have... Um, uh, abbreviations for certain disease specific things like uh, in this case it's uh, let me find a good one for you um, ISH in C2 hybridization okay and uh, things like that so if you're not familiar either with the research or with the particular medical condition the abbreviations would be helpful for you and that's it. So that's basically a protocol broken down for you. Um, if you guys want me to go even more in depth, although I don't think you really need it, and you can actually find protocols on Google. Just Google for protocols. Google Scholar sometimes has them. Um, so let, let me know what you guys think. Post in the comments, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Good luck.